Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Hi, Laurie. How are you today? Hi, Michael. Not too bad, thanks. Uh, it's a beautiful day here in Ireland. There's sun, which is remarkable. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I know that is because I lived in Ireland for a bit, so I know the sun is remarkable when it's out. Well, we had a lot of rain here in the UK over the weekend. Yeah. A lot. <laughs> yeah, there, there, was, there were a few downpours um, in the past few days, but right now, just for the moment, you know. You know the joke about Ireland? I'm sure you do. Um, the summer here is beautiful if you can only predict what day it will fall on. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But honestly, sometimes it happens in October, really. October is a great month for, for the weather yeah. here, I've found anyway. Yeah. Anyhow. And you've got, uh, we'll talk about where you are right now, but we, we you've got the, what do they call it? The the Atlantic Ocean Stream. What are the, the... Oh, yeah, the Gulf Stream. Gulf Stream, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> you've got yeah. the Gulf Stream coming. Or, I mean, I couldn't believe it because uh, you're in the south aren't you so I couldn't believe there were palm trees and things down there and I went what <laughs> is going on here <laughs> yeah. one of my favorite pictures is of Whitegate Bay I live in Whitegate um, and there's this little boat that's um, been turned into a like a flower bed and there's a, a palm tree just like tilted right over the top of it and it's just like <laughs> <laughs> something out of well do you know and I'm, I'm from america and so a very popular um program on tv um during the day was called gilligan's island i don't know if you've ever heard of it yes but, i have yeah but gilligan and his crew got stranded on this island and there was this palm tree that was <laughs> oh right <laughs> <laughs> and i keep thinking about that every time i drive out of our out of our main street of middleton i mean of whitegate <laughs> I can imagine. Yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Just for our listeners and viewers, just to explain that Laurie and I have been collaborating on LinkedIn for the last few weeks. Uh, and we didn't even know we were going to do this because this podcast had been planned for quite a long time. And uh, yeah, it's been a really interesting ride. So do come and check us out on LinkedIn audio as well. Um Laurie, um, this this podcast is not about LinkedIn. It's about you. And um, so I just start my podcast with one really open question. And that is, Laurie, please share us your story and how you got to where you are today. Oh, my goodness, Michael. It's a, it's a really <laughs> long story. Um, actually, I turned 55 yesterday. So this could be a very oh, long conversation. Happy birthday. <laughs> oh, Thank you. Awesome. I feel like I've I think I feel like I've made an achievement or something to hit fifty five. You know, <laughs> uh, every year is a an achievement, but yeah, fifty five is nice. Feels like more. <laughs> <laughs> it's a nice number, isn't it? Five five. Yeah. Very nice. Yeah. Yeah. In in the states, it's the speed limit. You know. Yes. Fifty five miles an hour. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is indeed. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah. Speaking of the states. Um, I come from Wisconsin, and I am actually the youngest of nine kids. Wow. And being the youngest of nine kids puts me at the tail end of the family. So I have um, over 78 first cousins. Whoa. I know about... <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> it's true. But oh. I know about six of them, um, personally, right. because being the youngest, all of the rest of them we're more like aunts and uncles, really, or distant relatives that, you know, you know that they're out there, but you don't really know them. Mm. Uh, so I, I kind of think I fell through the cracks a little bit, got lost in the shuffle. And and when I was little, I always wanted to live in Europe because I thought, ooh, then I would stand out a little bit. <laughs> right. <laughs> you got to be you got to be careful what you pray for, because these things happen. Yes. And uh, two other things that I prayed for when I was little was to be tall. And OK, so. By this generation's the you know the college graduate generation, I'm by no means tall, but by my generation, <laughs> oh man, I couldn't get a date because no guy wanted to date me. I was too tall. <laughs> oh, yeah. So you really have to be careful what you pray for, um, yes. especially especially um, because I prayed for 
my um to meet my husband camping because one of the things i absolutely adore doing is camping wow I absolutely adore it so i'm like 19 years old just in my second year of college and i meet this guy in this really amazing car right i mean yes wow honda prelude yes and it's camping i'm like yes (laughs) three weeks later we're engaged to be married and uh that was 30 years uh 34 years ago we're still married so um yeah it was a whirlwind romance but yeah it happened really fast and i think it was meant to be because like i said i'd been praying to meet you know a guy i met camping (laughs) unfortunately my theory was that he would like camping if i met him camping right yes (laughs) Well, I haven't been camping since. <laughs> oh God! He thinks he thinks that the uh, that roughing it is going into a hotel and getting room service. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's pretty much a little background of my life um, <laughs> in the United States. And I moved mm. to Ireland about thirty years ago. Wow. And um, yeah, I came along with my husband who got a job, and then I had to find a work permit. Yes. Um, in order to work. So there were a few years that I was kind of mooching around trying to figure out how to do this thing. And mm. finally, I started teaching English as a foreign language to business executives. Right. And that gave me such an, I don't know, just like broadened my horizons and gave me such a view on life as seen from Italy, from Germany, from Uh, Portugal, from Spain, from all of these countries where these top executives were coming from in order to improve their business English, learn communication skills and, you know, intercultural communication. So, um, yeah, 21 years full time working with business executives and learning all about business, but from a very safe place, the very safe place. But were they were they foreign nationals living in Ireland? No, they were. Um, so, for example, I had the um, financial director of Electricity de France come for two weeks, and um, to Ireland. So he lived. Yeah, he lived in an with an Irish family, right. and for the two weeks, and came into the office at eight thirty in the morning. So from eight thirty in the morning until four o'clock in the afternoon. He had this immersion training at our school and um, I would teach him for one hour and one session, the three hours in the morning and another teacher would be with him in the afternoon. Right. And then I would have another one-to-one client in the other part of the day. And I'm, I'm, I'm curious, why would foreign nationals come to Ireland to learn English? (laughs) <laughs> are you are you making some comment on the Irish accent? No, no not at all. <laughs> um, I think it was because the the service was available. My right. boss, my boss, just had this insight. He realized that in order to truly learn business English in a business environment, but having to be forced to speak English one hundred percent of the time was the only way that these people would have a chance of actually being able to go home with functional English. Yeah. And there just was no other service like that. I mean, they did have these schools where, where there, there were like for younger people in the UK, Mm. it just seemed like, like this place was really the only one that was totally focused on business. So. Yeah. So I always, how did, how I'm, I'm curious, how did you mimic the business environment for them? Well, um, actually, it's very much like what we're doing right now. Um, right. You're interviewing me about my job, so I would interview them about their job. I would ask them right. to explain what it was they did, and when they couldn't explain it, then I would help them. Right. And then that would lead them into giving a presentation on themselves. Right. And um, I would prepare them with the language that they would need to chair meetings and um, give opinions, agree and disagree politely, d- <laughs> diplomatically. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> which which is really funny coming from an American, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the um the American culture is so different. So sometimes they were working with Americans and they needed to know how an American 
would handle certain things. Yes. Yes. And then they would also get the insight from what it was like to work with. We had British, Australian, um, English, and of course, Irish trainers at the school. So they got a wide variety of people from different places teaching English. That's incredible because I I only ever did some cultural training once in my life. And I worked for a Japanese company at the time. And in that course, they did go through, um, they, they taught us what happened in meetings and how each culture would handle meetings differently. So the British meetings, they, they um, described it as a, they used a hedge as a metaphor. So if you've got a, a hedge and in, in the middle of the room, let's say, I don't know, if you, there was a British meeting and a decision had to be taken, the British would walk around the hedge multiple times <laughs> and just go <laughs> round it and round it and round it and no decision would be taken. At the end of the meeting, the hedge was still the hedge, you know, whereas if there was... Um, a, a meeting with U.S. nationals, USA from the USA, the the hedge would be <laughs> cut to shreds. Let's put it that way. <laughs> get off that chainsaw and whack that yeah. sucker down. <laughs> let's get let's get this hedge down now. Let's do it now. Yeah. You know, there's no need to wait. <laughs> yeah. um, I've never forgotten that. So yeah, that's super interesting because. It's not just about learning English. It's about how, how all the English speaking nations, but also other nations that use English, how they behave. Yeah. I yeah. Like actually, what's interesting about what you said is um, when you're dealing with Americans, if you say something really sort of softly, so um, say, for example, you make a statement like, um, global warming is bad. Okay. Mm. And I disagree with you. Okay. So I'm an American and I disagree with you. I would say I wouldn't agree with that. Yeah. Okay. But maybe in Britain, they might say, well, I'm afraid I would look at that from a different perspective. Mm. You know, there would be a longer lead in sentence. Now, I'm sure I don't know how a British person would actually say it, but but there would be a longer lead in sentence before yeah. actually saying, I don't agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. They, they would soften the blow, so yes. to speak. Yes. Um, be more to an, polite. Polite, I guess. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and if you say, I'm afraid I wouldn't agree with that to an American, they would hear the word afraid. And think afraid. Okay, so so you you what's what's making you nervous about not agreeing with me? Yes. <laughs> you know. Yes. <laughs> they they would be going. What? Why are you afraid? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and and I worked at a very young age. I worked for an American company when I came to the UK, and I'm Dutch, and. I felt that coming from the Netherlands where it's more akin to the American culture there, the very, the Dutch are very straight talking. They don't beat around the bush or the hedge, you know, I, I suppose it was a bush, not a hedge, right? Beat around the bush. We are very straight to Dutch. They kind of go, right. Black is black. White is white. There is no gray type of thing. And my dad always used to be like that. He had no gray in his language at all. And so coming to the UK, I had to really change the way I was. And then coming to then when I moved to Ireland, I had to change it again, even more so, because they used to call me um, the um, mad flying Dutchman uh, because I was running around corridors trying to get things done and everybody went, oh, well, tomorrow is great, it's grand, you know, and type of thing. And yeah, anyway, just a quick story there about yeah, things. Things cultures. aren't quite like that anymore, though. Ireland is Ireland is much more um, time sensitive than it was when we moved here in 92. Um, I remember I was just brought to tears sometimes by by the way 
people just really could not understand why, you know, it mattered so much what time it was to me. Yeah. <laughs> and there, there was there was a joke that was told to me that I just found oh, so powerfully funny. I mean, it still brings tears to my eyes sometimes. But it, it was the story, it was a it was an anecdotal joke. Um, so a Mexican guy and an Irish guy are talking. Mm. And the Mexican guy is saying, um, in, in Mexico we have this this expression, manana. Do you know do you know the expression manana? And the Irish and the Irish guy goes, see, yeah, yeah, I understand that that expression. Um, it means later. So, you know, don't don't worry, it's another time. And uh, yes. and then and then the um, Mexican guy says, so in Irish, is there is there an expression like that in Irish? And and the Irish guy looked at him like he was crazy. He said, no, we don't have any any word like that. That's that urgent. Urgent. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly how it felt when I came here. Yes. I mean, you can imagine the culture shock for an American coming to Ireland oh, in 92. percent And the Irish love the Americans, though, don't they? Yeah, I will. Um, I suppose that that's a generalization. But yeah, mm. I mean, there's a good relationship between the Irish and the Americans. Yes. And, um, and there's a little bit of a kind of a compassion between the two because... Everyone, every Irish person you meet has a friend or a relative that's got somebody in America. Yes. So there's always that touchstone. If you yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. So 20, did you say 21 years teaching? 21 business? years teaching full time um, with yeah. business English and um, communication, intercultural communication and that sort of thing. And yeah. then um, and then I stopped for a while because I was wasn't feeling so well. And um, then I had to feel well again. I had no choice because my daughter was diagnosed with a pretty serious condition that required her treatment in the States. So I had to I had to bring myself up out of my own illness and make myself well enough to care for her. Yeah. And I also had to start working again because, you know, you can't really pay for international medical treatment if you don't have extra income. So yes. I started I started working from my from my bedroom because getting up and actually driving a car wasn't possible back then. Right. And I taught four years, one to one English as a foreign language to Chinese children. They were so cute. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> it was. I mean, talk about teaching English to business executives and yes. doing all of these negotiations and all of that kind of stuff, and then going to kids, you know. Wow. And you're, and you're saying, "Hi, my name is Laurie." <laughs> <laughs> and then, and and it's interesting. Um, all of this, you know, these hand gestures that can say so much. You know, I learned yes. all of that. Yeah. Um, oh, and I, wow. And and then I, I learned a lot more about Chinese culture as well, which was an amazing thing. Yeah. Yeah. And but how I mean, did these children I mean, what age were they and did they have any English knowledge at all? Some some of them were absolutely nonverbal, so they had none, but they were doing a VIP kid platform, which is like they, they would have things to study before coming and meeting me and then right. after my class they would have things to study afterwards yeah. to prepare for the next one so um so they were doing a lot of listening and a lot of repeating but i don't think that they some of them were so little they had no idea what they were saying they were just copying you know yes yes um, yeah um uh, but then others were very fluent very fluent, really and they got into huge debates with me on American and Chinese politics, which was not actually allowed because you're not supposed to talk no. about those things. But I mean, <clears throat> kids, they, they want to ask, they ask the question yeah. and they, you try to redirect them. And sometimes they're tenacious. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and when, and when they're that well-spoken, you, you know, yes. unless you want to seem like you're avoiding the conversation or you're being, dishonest you have to answer them yeah yeah but every single class was recorded so it was really important to get 
every, to, to, to be very careful. Yeah. How things were said. Yeah. Great. Oh, that must have been great fun. Yeah. I had children aged uh, four, three and a half. My youngest student was three and a half and my eldest was 14. Wow. So the wide range, 1,547 children worked with me by the time I finished. My God, that's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Four years of working, eight hours a day, a half hour classes. So 16 children a day. Wow. Yeah. Oh, well done. That sounds amazing. Yeah. And why did that end? Um, because, uh, well, for one, there is only <laughs> so, so many children I can. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. Um, yeah. it, it, it does. There, there is, there comes a point where it's just not fulfilling anymore when you've right. done something so much and for so long, and you're so good at it that you're no longer learning and growing. And you just need something more. Great. And also then there was the restrictions on the platform itself that um, I found I didn't want to work within those restrictions anymore. So I decided to start my own business. And, Yay. And that's how we happen to be talking right now, because I decided to just stop VIP Kid and move on. Right, right. And was, did you already, when you decided to stop, did you already have something in mind or did you stop first and then decide to do something? Which way around did it go? I actually, um, I just came to a point where I'd been teaching eight hours that day and I got contacted by the company <clears throat> once again, telling me that I had infringed on some rule that they had. And I said, okay, I quit. <laughs> Right, <laughs> And then I said to myself, you know what, I've got so much experience teaching English as a foreign language, I can just like start up my own business doing this. And so that's what I started to do. And right. then I realized that it wasn't so much VIP kid platform that I didn't like. It was just after 25 years of teaching English, mm. I just, I was done. I just, I was done. <laughs> that's a long time. Yeah. 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 So Makes then sense. I then I just pivoted and I decided that what I would do is um, coach parents who, like me, had children with serious medical conditions so right. that they could get through the overwhelm and start yeah. parenting their kids with joy and happiness rather than, oh, so many parents will, when their child gets a diagnosis, grab their phone and start checking every single symptom that possibly could be happening and you know, second guessing their doctor's opinions, looking up all of the words that they learned, and they could spend seven or eight hours a day just Googling. Yeah. And that's not seven or eight hours that they're not spending either working, cleaning, house, cooking food for their kids, you know? Yeah. I mean, yeah. You, you know, you, you don't have that much time to just kill, you know, every day. And that's what, that... what what inspired you though to do that to start helping other parents? I appreciate you were in that situation, but what what made you go right? I'm going to start coaching. When I got to that stage where I stopped working at VIP Kid, I became so very much aware that during that time when I was ill and for about two years before that, I lost probably seven years of my children's early childhood rearing. I lost that time. Right. And I lost it in part due to their diagnoses and my worrying about it so much. Yeah. My own illness as well, yeah. trying to recover from that. And then this mad dash to try and solve the problem for my daughter that yes. I stayed so focused on all of that, that I didn't even notice what my children were excelling at in school. And, you know, there's nothing that you regret more than mm. realizing that you lost, you lost time with your children and it, nobody made you do that. You did that to yourself. Yeah. And that guilt that stays with you for the rest of your life. Wow. And I um I don't want that to happen to other parents. Mm. 
to to help them move from this overwhelming sensation of oh my goodness i did something or why didn't i do something sooner or how did i not know this or what do i do now yeah and and there is nothing to do you did nothing wrong you mm-hmm. couldn't have known sooner but all you're doing is letting those thoughts cycle through your head over and over and over again day in day out mm-hmm. and that energy translates to your kids and your kids grow up worried and they don't even know why they're worried they just know that there's something out there this scary thing out there because their parents are worried and and they pick that up from them so if we can if we can somehow help parents step outside of those overwhelming emotions and allow the parents to just enjoy their child's childhood you know get on the floor and play with the lego and you know yeah that sort of thing well, then I'm going to try and help them do that. Wow. And so th- this was like a bit of a calling, really, to say, I want to do this for other people to help them. Yeah. 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 So then what I did was I spent the next um, 14 months doing intensive training in coaching. Right. And um, after I finished my um, my certified life coach training yeah then i started working one-to-one with parents and the 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 transformation so when you're when you're teaching english as a foreign language you really really need to have a lot of concentration because you have to listen deeply you have to understand what the person is trying to say and then supply them with the words that they need and the grammar and the structure and then explain it all so it's it's very intense. Yeah. So I know what having intense conversations is like. Yeah. But there's none of that amazing feeling of fulfillment. You know, when somebody says the sentence the correct way in English, you're like, great, you know. But when a parent smiles for the first time, you know, they're oh. like, wow. And they have that aha moment that amazing fulfilling feeling of being able to get them to that level Mm. it's there's nothing so powerful or beautiful and it's the best work i've ever done so oh that's great i I mean and of course it's not you doing it is it it's they are doing it yeah and that makes it even more satisfying that they finally have that realization that they can do it themselves yeah yeah Mm. yeah Yeah, i believe that every parent is the expert for their own child yeah i mean the parent knows their eating schedule their sleeping schedule what they're afraid of what they like what they don't like what they'll do what they won't do Mm. and so parents really are the expert of the whole child yeah so if you go to a heart doctor and you know your child has you know pain in their chest and so you take them to the GP and the GP sends them off to the heart doctor and the heart doctor says, yeah, no, there's nothing wrong with the heart. Go on home. Are you mm. going to just go home or are you going to go back to the GP and say, okay, what next? Yeah. You're going to keep finding the answers for your kids, right? Yes. So the heart doctor is not the specialist for your child. He's the heart specialist. Yeah. And so let's imagine that it is a heart problem. And the specialist gives a solution that you know will just traumatize your child. Hmm. You might feel compelled to do it anyway. Hmm. Because, I mean, he's the expert, right? Yeah. And one of the things that I do is I empower parents to advocate for their children. So for every diagnosis that there is, there are a variety of different ways to solve that. Some of them are technically or clinically or medically better. And others work, maybe take longer or might have some side effects. So what the doctor does is he picks out the best one from his perspective. Yeah. And presents it to you. Mm. And, And then 
you know that your child, for example, has sensory issues and whatever this treatment is, it's really going to aggravate the sensory issues. Well, the doctor is a heart doctor. He doesn't know about the sensory issues, right? No, no. So then you're going, oh, God, how are we going to make this happen? And you try to do it. Yeah. You try to do it. But but why not ask the question, so what other possible treatment methods are there? Yeah, I would like to hear what else there is. And if the doctor says that's the only one, say, well, then I would like a second opinion yeah. because I'm almost positive there must be another way to handle this. And and when you say that to the doctor on the same equal footing as an expert of this child mm -hmm. to the expert of the heart, you're going to get a response that will maybe be a solution that would work better for your child or maybe not. I mean, but you you have that right to ask the questions. Mm. And when parents feel empowered instead of helpless, then they have hope. It doesn't matter whether they actually have to do this thing that the doctor first originally suggested. At least they don't feel helpless. They feel like they've asked all the questions, they've investigated all the avenues, and then they made the best decision for their child. Yeah. But most people don't think that way. Most people no. think you just listen to the doctor. Um, and maybe you sometimes... And this is this is not dissing doctors at all, but sometimes the doctor's solution suits the doctor or suits the hospital. Yes. Because the hospital has the facilities for this treatment. Yeah. <laughs> or the yeah. doctor is the specialist in this thing. Um, so he can't, he doesn't really know, he's never done that thing before. So he's not so sure that you know, I'm I better go with the thing I'm. I'm really good at, you know, That's right. and, and the doctor really has a vocation to help people. They're trying their best. It's not like they're trying to hoodwink the parents or anything, but maybe what they're offering isn't exactly perfect for your family. And so you should be able to ask those questions. So because what we normally think, I mean, I've seen this many times with, um, probably relatives that are a little bit older and are in hospital for different reasons or not in hospital even you know they go to doctors and things and it's all this like oh yes doctor oh yes whatever you say doctor yeah oh thank you so much doctor oh you must be very busy oh i'm so sorry you know and it's this kind of apologetic approach to doctor where as you said we're not on an equal footing we 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 kind of subservient to the doctor or oh, whatever you think is best yeah yeah we'll do that yeah okay you, you you're the expert you know what is best and so i'm really interesting how you've put that over and what you say makes so much more sense to me thank you i think i think the message i mean if if people hear this podcast and they never come to me but they decide to just ask those questions, mm. then I've done my job. Yes. You know, because once parents feel empowered, then they know they can ask questions and they can get the results that they need. Then they they start saying, what else can we do? Can yes. we go to Disney World? Can we go, can we take, can we take a long walk in the woods? How can we make this wheelchair fit on the beach? You know, mm. and they come up with solutions because now they're empowered to get the answers on their own instead of waiting for somebody to tell them what to do. Yeah. Yeah. Because normally we start from a place of total fear, worry, stress. And therefore, well, you know, as a coach, when you are stressed, all the blood drains from your brain and goes through your muscles because it's the flight fight <laughs> or fight and flight even uh syndrome you know you blood drains from your brain and you need blood to the front of your brain the executive to make sensible decisions yeah. and ask the sensible questions so when you're in kind of fear and stress yeah you don't have the capacity to ask those kind of questions at all yeah that's you're, you're, true. you're not you're not empowered as you say that's true and and when you you as a parent are 
unempowered, when you're overwhelmed with stress, when you're not thinking so clearly, when all of that happens, then your health starts to fail and your energy depletes. Yes. And now you've got a child with extra needs who is also a child who's already energetic, <laughs> maybe energetic in ways that worry you because you're afraid they're going to injure themselves or yeah. do something that they shouldn't be doing or eat something they shouldn't eat or any number of, I mean, the number of things that can happen when you have a child with a serious diagnosis, you're always, it's always there in the back of your mind. You're always vigilant. Yeah. Right. So where yeah. are you going to get that energy? How are you going to replenish your, your well of energy? Mm. If you're, if you're always stressed, if you're always worried, if you're always anxious. So getting out of all of that and being able to be creative, to take advantage of your resources. And when I say resources, I mean, family and friends, not only take advantage of them, but also set the boundaries. Like, yeah, this is my child. This is the way we're going to, this is the way we're handling our child's care. Yes. If you want to help us, thank you. Come and help. Yeah. Yeah. But if you think you know better then mm, that yeah. that's not going to work. So how, how are we going to set the boundary on parents who say, well, you should be doing this. And then you're going, not another person telling me what to do when they've got no clue. So you also have this loneliness, this sense of being distanced from people because the regular typical things that would be a solution for a healthy child are not an option for a lot of people with their children mm -hmm. who have a serious diagnosis. Yes. But other people don't don't realize that. Mm -hmm. No. And I guess other people think they're doing they're being helpful by coming up with suggestions and ideas. Oh, well, have you tried this? Or mm -hmm. why don't you do this? I know somebody who has done this yeah. with their situation. And you and yeah, you kind of go, yeah, that's not very helpful at all. It's yeah, just so, mm -hmm. so recently I had a conversation with someone. I was telling them about why we have to take my daughter to California for her medical treatment. Mm -hmm. And um, I explained what her condition was. And we've been doing this for five years. Yes. So, and, and it's expensive. I mean, like <laughs> crazy, stupid expensive. In America, yeah. So you would think, you would think that I would probably investigate every other option before I would do this thing. Yeah. hundred percent. I, I, would, I would be like, I would, I would put my, I would put my, like, make sure that this is like the only thing that we can do mm. and investigate all avenues. So, you know, you say, well, we're coming to the last few treatments for, for our daughter and it's only a couple of more times we have to go, mm. um, but we're coming to the end of our financial, you know, thing. And what will they say? Well, why isn't there some place in Ireland that can do that? Uh, well, actually, no, but that's the reason we had to go outside of the country, yes. you know. Um, and, you know, and then they would start asking like questions about like obvious things that I would have asked myself five years ago. hundred percent. Yeah. And I don't, and where other parents might go, you are, you're, you're insulting me. You're, mm. you're, you're behaving as though I don't have a brain in my head and I haven't figured this out already. Mm. asked these questions in a hundred different ways and found no answers for that. So I had to do something else. Yeah. Um, that's how, that's your knee jerk reaction when people are offer, offering advice. Yeah. Right. So how else can you look at that? You can look at that as if I were in their shoes, what would I be wanting to do right now? I would be wanting to help, but I can't help. So I'll come up with ideas. Yes. Isn't, you know, just trying to generate ideas so generous and so kind of them? Aren't <laughs> they trying their best for you? I mean, really, I mean, you, you can see that they're just, their heart is there trying to help you. So mm. if you can just put yourself into that perspective and just allow them to ask those questions with that yeah. heart-centered feeling, and and you can respond to them from the same 
generosity instead of shutting them down, getting offended, and burning a possible bridge of connection. Yes. Because, you know, some parents might go, oh, my God, will you ever just leave me alone? I need space. Go away. (laughs) Yes. Um, But instead of saying, wow, you know, that's so thoughtful of you to try and um, brainstorm with me. Um, I'm really too tired right now to do that. Yeah. Uh, But I'll take into consideration what you've said. Uh, And then you just talk about something else. And that finishes it. They feel like they've contributed. They've been acknowledged for trying to help. Yes. And you still have that. You still got that family member and you still have a friend possibly at the end of that. Whereas the other method would be if you were to cut them down, you'd lose a family member, you'd lose a friend. And that gets back to what you said earlier. That's where the loneliness then happens, doesn't it? You feel so alone then. Yeah. And you stack up more stress, which is depleting mm. your energy, which means you have less for your children. Mm. And it becomes a vicious uh, a vortex of negative energy yeah. just all around you. So if you can eliminate that vortex, neutralize it, and turn it into a vortex of positive energy. Yes. Why not? Yeah. You know? Mm. So. Yeah. It's hard, though, isn't it? When you're... And I guess that's why you're helping and coaching people to to deal with that. But it when you're in the middle of the worry, fear, and stress that we talk about, talked about, then the first person that will trigger you may get it, you know, in the neck from you. You may go, <clears throat> that was just one too many. I could I didn't have the resources to be kind to be thoughtful to be appreciative in that moment i i just flipped (laughs) yeah and you know um emotions are kind of like um could 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 we translate them somehow i i'm not a scientific person at all so you can correct me if if my my description of this is way off base but emotions bring hormones hormones flood your bloodstream your bloodstream goes through your whole body right Mm. so if we were to imagine a clear glass of water clear glass and there's water in it and you imagine a red dye being dropped into that clear glass of water Mm. and that red dye let's just call that the trigger for an emotion of anger yes so somebody says something that just (laughs) it goes in Okay. And that one drop is there in that one spot. That one person did this thing. And if it doesn't get agitated, then it'll pretty much stay there. It'll, it'll like be suspended in that spot and you'll see the red in that, in that one spot. And there can still be parts that are not affected, but as time goes on, it dissipates and it goes through your whole glass of water. And then the color of the water is slightly Mm -hmm. pink. And then another drop goes in and then Mm. another drop goes in and then another drop goes in. And three months later, your whole glass is red. Yes. Okay. This, this being flooded by these negative emotions all the time, Mm. just your whole body is flooded by these hormones or chemicals that are triggering your, your protective instinctive um, attack brain. Yeah. And you need to be able to step outside of that into the other side of your brain, which is creative, innovative, empathetic, Mm. you know, Mm. and when you can get there and some people use meditation to do that, other people use reasoning, but -hmm. when you get there, when you get to that place, it's where you can breathe. It's like, ah, just that time by yourself. And parents don't give themselves time by themselves because they have to be vigilant for their child. Yes. So their child is always in the room with them. Mm. Right. So where do they find that? You know, it sounds impossible, but Mm. I've been there. I've done that. And it's not impossible. You can do it. It just means that you've got maybe a different way of approaching it than your average Joe on the street. Yeah. Yeah. 
I, I love that. <clears throat> that glass of water analogy or metaphor, it you can really see how it happens, can't you? And it, I mean, whether it's parents with children that are struggling and suffering or whether it's life in general with you know human beings that don't have those situations you can still see how that happens the kind of the red dye kind of the drops going in and eventually just seeing red then at the end of it yeah i love yeah. that I, I will always remember that thank you <laughs> yeah i i love using um analogies um because i think that when you can visualize something mm. it's easier to it's yeah. easier to remember it. And, and that's, that's a, actually a coaching technique that I think also helps people because when you can, when you can draw a picture for somebody, it helps them to place themselves inside the picture without the restriction of, uh, uh, in, in the case of me creating the picture, without the yeah. restriction of my boundaries their creative mind will allow them to place themselves inside the picture and get their own insights from it. Maybe not the thing I thought that I was saying, maybe mm. they'll get something even better. Yeah. Absolutely. One of, one of my favorite um, metaphors is the hot air balloon metaphor. Okay. Would you like on. to hear it? Yes. Love yes. to hear it. Yes. Okay. So imagine, imagine you have a child and your baby is in a basket, right? And the basket is the vessel that carries your baby through life on this journey through life. Mm. And the basket is attached to a hot air balloon. Okay. Yep. <clears throat> so I would like to ask you if your baby was in this basket attached to this hot air balloon, what would your role be? Would you be the wind driving the hot air balloon? Would you be the hot air helping your child lift up and elevate themselves? Would you be the ballast giving them stability and direction? Would you be the storm on the horizon? Wow. So when you do that and you think about who am I? What am I doing right now? I'm in this crazy haze of emotion and anger and frustration am i the storm on the horizon mm. oh my god and i think i was for a while i think i was yeah. a storm on the horizon for my kids but now i hope i'm their ballast yeah but maybe you'd like to be the air current that would help them find the right direction to yeah. move them along it doesn't matter really this this metaphor is great because you can imagine the birds out there. You can imagine other hot air balloons. You can just, I mean, you can really let this metaphor go and just see your child's life yeah. through this metaphor. And it can be beautiful or it can be frightening. And then it helps you as a parent to decide who do, we, who do you want to be today? Yeah. Today, I want to be the hot air that helps my child rise up maybe next week. I'll be the air current that moves them in the right direction, or yep. maybe I'll be the ballast that keeps them on track, keeps them stable. Um, maybe the ballast is too heavy. Maybe it's dragging them down. I don't want to yes. be a ballast. So there's yes. so much, I mean, you can do with it. And you can release some ballast as well, can't you? Mm -hmm. And let it go. And at an appropriate time in their life, you can let all the ballast go. They don't need you anymore. You know, they can cope yeah. on their own yeah, as well. And they can and get then, over that mountain by themselves. Yeah. And then there is the basket. You know, how beautiful can the basket be? You know, what can you put in the basket to help your child? <laughs> you know, what, what are all the things you can give them so that makes yeah. them happy? And how creative can they be inside the basket? How creative can you be inside the basket? Oh, you're bringing you know? tears to my eyes here, Michael. <laughs> I know, but I can really see it now. You know, it's yeah. that's brilliant. Yeah, I love it. Love that's it. one of the that's one of the tools I use in my coaching. Um, I, I have all kinds of metaphors, but that's my favorite one for parents because I think it's yeah. so powerful. Very powerful indeed. Yeah. 
very powerful yeah. yeah and although i don't have children of my own um i have two stepsons and um one of them has been ill and has a disability today and so when i see him in the hot air balloon now i can see him once you've mentioned that uh, i can really relate to that and yeah that's incredible incredible love it and that will also stay with me forever now <laughs> can't get that out of my brain yeah the, there was one woman who um who i worked with and when i gave her that metaphor she she burst into tears because she could see the bottom of the basket falling out because oh. her son had been put in prison right for drug related um activities yes and she couldn't see a way to get around that mm. so so i asked her if the bottom is falling out who are you mm. and she and she said i'm the safety net wow yeah brilliant brilliant yeah yeah so you know there are ways to bring hope even to the worst situations you know yes. you can find ways and by being creative and getting into that side of your mind we've just been by doing this imagination of this hot air balloon exercise we've been in the creative side of our minds mm. which mm. gives us so much more capacity for generating all kinds of um possibilities that can give us better opportunities and better decisions more creative ways of solving problems yes. and doing it without injuring anybody mm. you know mm. yeah so brilliant okay so this is now what you do the coaching um for parents and do you do this in person on video across the world um what what's what's your offer in terms of how you're providing this to people if there are people who are local to me i would be more yeah. than happy to meet them in person yeah but my main part of my business is online i yeah. work i work internationally with people in america and i have a client in singapore i have two clients in the uk yeah so so usually through Zoom meetings, one-to-one -one, um, conversations, yeah. um, I, I support the whole um, thing with an app, um, a coaching app that okay. they can use every day and keep keeping their thoughts focused on when to um, question negative thoughts they have and ask themselves if they're really true. Yeah. So the app is extremely effective. Um, and what's really great about the app is if you go online and you you find you find the app online and you want to download it, it's, it gives you six weeks of training and mm -hmm. support wow. with no coach, with no coach. Um, and then the option of staying with the app for another year. At the end of the year, the app disengages um and that costs a thousand dollars for that right. app but as one of my clients it would be part of our coaching so that app along with my coaching would be all like a bundle gotcha. and so so it's really um an effective methodology so they've got somebody who can help them specifically my parents have someone who can help them specifically with the issues around a diagnosis and the stress that comes with that. Yes. And also the, the coaching that you can get support from just general coaching from the app. Okay. And it's a positive intelligence um, app. Right. Um, Sh Shirzad, Shirzad Shamin is the, um, the person who developed this app. And yeah. he's he's a Stanford University professor who um, I think he went to Harvard, I want to say. Anyway, he's this like hot shot guy. Mm. And um, so I got training from him in positive intelligence as well. 
recently. Right. And so I'm not only a certified life coach, but I'm also a positive intelligence coach as well. And that really, okay. really effective in supporting parents. In six weeks, they no longer need me. Wow. I mean, you would think that parents of children with serious medical conditions are going to need somebody like hold their hand for three years or something. Six weeks and they can be done, you know? Yeah. It doesn't you don't have to be in this in this state of constant anxiety. No. Constantly if, needing to lean on somebody to try and get you through. Yeah. When you can just build yourself up and lean on yourself and mm. realize, I got this. Yeah. <laughs> It'll be fine. Yeah. Oh, that's so. amazing. I mean, that definitely is hopeful, isn't it, for people to appreciate that that's possible, that they can turn their life around, their their feelings around, their situation around, emotionally anyway, in six weeks. I know that, you know, the issue will still be there, but looking at it totally differently will be, yeah, that's cool. Six weeks. Yeah. Great. Yeah, I was I was just recently talking to a coach um, and he said, you know, the way you think about something can have a huge impact on the way you behave. So if you say, oh, it's been a long day, I'm so tired. OK, that's going to have a whole different effect on your next thing you do. Right. You probably yeah. flop on the couch, grab a beer. <laughs> yes. Or if you say. Wow, I've had a long day. I could do with some energy. Mm. What might you do if you said I could do with some energy? Might you take a walk? Might yeah. you go, you know, like, hey, I've got an energetic puppy. I'll go spend time with him. Yes. <laughs> you know, yes. um, it, it's it's so much. It's a different thing. And that's what that's what I do. I help people be able to say. That was a tough day. And then the next words coming out of their mouth is not, I'm depressed, I'm mm. overwhelmed, mm. I'm drained. Yes. The next words out of their mouth will be, and man, did I just nail it. You know, mm. I did that. Mm. So, yeah. It's, I, I was listening to something this morning along those lines, and it's, it's about having, I mean, there are only two emotions, aren't there? There is pleasure and there is not pleasure. And it's being able to recognize those where you're at right now in this moment. I mean, right now, I know I'm in pleasure because I enjoy interviewing people for this podcast. I know you a little bit already. I know you a lot more now after this conversation. And that's giving me pleasure it gives me a nice feeling you know yeah. but at the end of this something could happen i open the office door the phone could ring an email could arrive would take me into not pleasure but it's recognizing where you are and it doesn't mean you have to stay there because those emotions will come and go we're human aren't we that's our human our physical human apparatus works in that way <laughs> you know it's either pleasure or not pleasure and kind of go oh this is not pleasure but i don't need to stay there so that's what you're saying really is saying oh i had a really stressful day not pleasure but i'm really enjoying it. it's over now and i can do some other exciting things and yeah. i can move it i can move into pleasure in a heartbeat rather than stay and kind of wallow in the not pleasure yeah, I I love that. Imagine imagine having the same emotion day in day out forever. You're just you're just okay. Imagine you'll never be truly delighted. You'll never you'll never be excited. You'll never be angry. Mm. Just imagine. Boring. How boring would that be? <laughs> It's totally boring. So, yeah. So when when we have these emotions, why not enjoy them? I mean, mm. they're ours. Why not just embrace them and then say, "Okay, I'm done with you. Let's yes. go on to a different one." I yes. don't like that emotion so much that I want to stay with it for the rest of my life. <laughs> you know, um, you can you can imagine like anger. Anger is a good emotion. I think people should get angry. 
there's a point when you've got to just say stop you know yeah and when that emotion comes and and you 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 say stop it's like putting your hand on a hot plate like it's like it hurts the anger hurts the fear the the guilt the depression whatever it is it hurts you don't want to be there so you take it away why stay there but yes. it's given you a heads up it's given you an aha something's not right i have to fix it i have to change direction how am i going to do that yeah and if you can take your hand off of a hot stove when you when you touch it yeah. why not take your heart out of the anger yes yeah and i i can i can teach people how to do that so Brilliant. thank you thank you wow that sounds amazing <laughs> so combined with the app or not or with the coaching the positive intelligence there's there's a whole you have a whole toolkit of things that you can help people with and right now is your focus specifically on parents that have children with you know that are suffering in some way with illness or disability or i i have a, a great deal of compassion mm. for parents who are who are dealing with this because you know i i don't i don't think that i can help their children because i'm not their children's expert right no as yep. i said earlier yes so how can i help their children by helping them of course and and they i mean they've got all the tools they need all they need to do is just open the door and access them and i can mm. help them open the door i know how to do that part so yes. so that's they are the people that i would give first priority to perfect you know yeah but i'm not going to turn away somebody who says oh um i'm really dealing with a lot of anxiety because i lost my job yeah um, and I know you, Lori, you, you know, you, I know you're a good coach. I'd really like to work with you. I'm not going to say, well, you're not a parent. <laughs> no, I know. I mean, I know. I'm not going to do that. I, I, I no. will talk. I will talk to you. But but yeah, my Got specialty it. are parents of children with medical concerns. Yeah. Because I have two children and between them, they have four serious diagnoses. So mm. I know what that's like. Yes. And it's nice when you're working with somebody who just gets it. Yeah. Yeah. And somebody who knows what you're going through, who's been there, has got the T-shirt, has been able to overcome a huge amount herself. And then people come from a place of trust already, you know, out of the, out of the blocks almost from the beginning, they are going to go, you have an understanding and an empathy. You always... Yeah, you don't know their exact situation, but you have that empathy. Brilliant. Yeah. Laurie, I've really enjoyed our conversation. Is is there anything that I should have asked that you wanted to share that I haven't? I will ask you in a minute about how people get in touch, but is there anything that we've missed that you would have liked to have shared? Um, no, I think that it was a very... A very satisfying and fulfilling conversation, Michael. You're an yes. excellent your interviewer. It's lovely talking to you. And um, yeah, Likewise. if anybody if anybody wants to learn more, they can find me. You know, they can go out there and look for me. I'm not hard to find. Uh, so, do you want to share where they can find you then? Actually, you know, um, I did a Google search on my name, and I'm the first person who comes up. Woo yeah. And do you want to know why? Not to not to like harp on the whole LinkedIn thing, but apparently mm. if you're on LinkedIn and you're like doing stuff on LinkedIn, you come up first in Google searches if people look up your name. Yeah. So just search my name, Lori Showstrom, and you'll find my LinkedIn profile and there will be all of my other details. Um, but my website is laurieshowstrom.com. Right. And I know Showstrom, you're going, um, how would you spell that? But um, I'm hoping somewhere on this podcast, somebody will be able yes. to find it. Um, yes. Lori Showstrom, my name, my first name is Lori, spelled like um, the famous actor Hugh Lori, his last yes. name. 
Yes. And if ever I marry Hugh Laurie, my name would be Lori Lori. <laughs> 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 so Lori, Lori Showstrom, and that's a Swedish name. So there's a J in there. Yeah. And I don't say it the right way. I mean, people in Sweden are probably rolling their eyes at how I say it. Okay. <laughs> but I say it with an American accent, so I'm not going to apologize because I'm American. Um, and my um, my second name is spelled S J O, S T R O M. So yeah. It's easy to remember the vowels because they're two O's. Yes. And if you imagine that the J sounds like an H, then the rest of it should be pretty easy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Showstrom, S-J-O-S-T-R-O-M. So, Great. Yeah. LauraShowstrom.com. They, they can go and, and the yeah. notes will be in, you know, the podcast anyway, so people can look at the show notes and, and uh, just click through. They don't even need to search. Just click through it. <laughs> Yeah, on your mobile or desktop or wherever you are. Oh, that's great! Thank you for doing that. My pleasure. It's been wonderful to hear your story and how it's all unfolded. I think it's a magical journey, and I wish you so much continued success. Um, I know you're going to the U.S. soon, so I want to want you know have a wonderful and successful and productive trip there, um, and hope you and your daughter will receive everything you need right now thank you thank you very um, much yeah we're leaving in two days and um it's an 11 day trip so uh yeah i'm really looking forward to 11 days with my young 18 year old daughter who can actually maybe introduce me to california once you know great yeah nice. that'd be wonderful wonderful yeah. um Thank you so much for being on the podcast. We'll be in touch soon, uh, no doubt. And uh, yeah, we'll continue at some point with LinkedIn Audio, but you're away and that's absolutely great. You you continue your important work that you're doing, helping all those wonderful parents to support their kids. That's great work. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michael. Take care. Bye for now. Bye-bye. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please rate, subscribe, and share at will. I'm always looking for more listeners and guests, so do get in touch, please. You can find me pretty easily by searching for Staying Alive UK. Thank you. Staying Alive UK. Share your story.